Hello, everyone. Welcome back again. Um, I am delighted we're recording episode two with um, our friend Dimitros, the CEO of Kiomos. Uh, Dimitros, welcome back again. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Phil, for the invitation. Always a pleasure to be here. Oh, well, it's, it's a delight. You're, you're, you're a great guy to spend time with. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who's watching this to reach out to you on LinkedIn. And, you know, you're always available with good advice. And I know a lot of companies are taking you up on that and certainly engaging with Kiomos to um to help them with their security posture and help them with their to become a better organization and so i think if anyone should look you up um dimitrios you can look them up on linkedin and also kiomos um so today there's a few topics i want to cover um based on our last uh conversation mm -hmm. i think the first one is that area about resilience um it's a word i hear a lot and it depends on the circumstances but from from a cyber security point of view describe what you mean by resilience uh Resilience uh, has been uh, enjoying the attention of uh, the market and the regulators uh, the last couple of years. Uh, the main thing with resilience is that uh, we want to make sure that uh, the organization is, going, is not uh, going to suffer a significant uh, impact because of a security breach. And uh, even when that happens, um, the main uh, services and products that the organization offers to the market will uh, still be available and uh, they will not be uh, hindered by any uh, uh, adverse uh, effects of, uh, the, of the attack. Um, why is the resilience important? I think the resilience um, is uh, almost a game changer. It is a game changer because um, it sends a very clear message to uh, the stakeholders, first of all, and to all the rest of the world. No matter how hard security departments are trying to stop uh, all uh, uh, the attacks, uh, there will be a moment where our systems will be under immense pressure. Uh, so it is uh, admittance that uh, we cannot stop everything. And therefore, instead of uh, trying to rely on uh, thick and, talk, uh, and tall uh, walls to bounce off all the attacks, uh, we should uh, develop the capabilities to make sure that uh, when uh, an attack is successful, it doesn't necessarily force the organization to reach the breaking point. And the breaking point will be when we will uh, stop being able to provide the main uh, services uh, uh, the organization offers to the market. Uh, from a regulator uh, point of view, uh, the interest is to make sure that uh, the end client is protected and uh, they create um, uh, conditions for a healthy marketplace. Um, and that's why they want to say that uh, the organizations have gone through the due diligence process uh, to make sure that um, they will be able to carry on providing uh, their uh, important business services. Absolutely. And one of the other terms that I've heard you use, I think it goes hand in hand with this from what you said to me before, um, is that whole ideology of, of elasticity that goes and sort of combines with resilience. What do you mean by elasticity? Um, elasticity is... Um, highlighting the need to make sure that uh, we have a clear understanding of what is materially important for the organization. And from a security perspective, we uh, add the mechanisms that will allow those uh, assets, uh, those things that are uh, truly important to withstand the pressure without reaching a breaking point. When they reach a breaking point, we do have the traditional uh, business uh, continuity processes in place to recover those assets. But uh, with uh, elasticity in mind, what we want to achieve is to make sure that uh, we won't reach uh, that um, uh, threshold as easily as uh, was the case in the past. And uh, so with elasticity in mind, uh, we need to understand uh, the characteristics of the assets, uh, what are the qualitative and uh, qualitative um, traits that we want to preserve during an attack 
and uh, we make sure that we deploy the right uh, controls uh, and we come up with architectures to to support those needs um, and this will allow us to, to uh, protect the core assets uh, also known as critical products and services uh, during an attack uh, which uh, in turn provides us with the opportunity to undertake the necessary actions to bounce back on uh, our feet without having to uh, trigger the business continuity processes. So in, a, in a reality, we want to, with elasticity in mind, to uh, remove any single points of failure uh, in our organization uh, that may uh, uh, impact uh, the operational efficacy of uh, those services that truly matter. And does it does elasticity also mean a flexible approach, or is, is it more about just having that bounce back ability? Um, just so I understand it from my own point of view. Elasticity uh, obviously means uh, the flexible approach. Uh, otherwise, it, won't, it wouldn't be elastic, and it wouldn't be elastic mainly because uh, one service from another uh, may share some common characteristics but there will be unique ones as well and therefore you cannot expect the same security mechanism to be equally successful for protecting uh, all the services you have uh, uh, in place and um, the key point with uh, resilience in mind and elasticity of course is that we need to work with the business uh, counterparts in order to truly understand the success uh, criteria for those assets. So what are the characteristics, the idiosyncrasy of those uh, assets so that we provide the same level of assurance by deploying different techniques and by uh, utilizing different security services. Now that's brilliant because I think one of the uh, criticisms that's often leveled at the, at the security uh, department or division is that they're often too rigid um, in their approach. So I think the, the way you're describing there, I think is more business centric, more business focused and business continuity focused, which sounds great. Uh, yeah, yes, so you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the favorite uh, nicknames is of the security department is the business prevention unit. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> mainly because uh, quite often, especially in the past, uh, we were not focusing on what the business requirements were. Uh, we, uh, our, our focus uh, was on the security uh, controls, mechanisms, and we would try to enforce them no matter what the business was trying to do. Uh, and uh, obviously that explains uh, the pushback that uh, we experience sometimes when we are interacting with uh, business stakeholders and uh, the negative vibes. Uh, every time uh, they have to reach out to uh, security department. And uh, even these days, uh, security is being treated as uh, a utility. Um, and as a utility, we will never be, uh, um, let's say, um, congratulated for keeping the lights on, but uh, we will be heavily penalized when we fail uh, doing so. And that, that is uh, why uh, it is very important for uh, security to be able to understand the context within which we are asked to offer our services and uh, become uh, essentially a value provider for the business. Because our role is to understand what the business is trying to achieve and help them do that in a safe manner. In, uh, by providing the uh, assurance uh, required. And, and with that in mind, so from an, uh, deploying this ideology of elasticity and resilience, what are the commercial advantages, the practical advantages for a, an organization? One of the main drivers for organizations is the commercial side of uh, the resilience. Why? Because it means that uh, they will uh, 
be able to provide uh, seamlessly uh, security, uh, sorry, uh, uh, products and services. So whatever they are offering to the market and the end client will uh, be continuously available. And uh, so they won't experience uh, uh, outages. And uh, outages, we know that they have a direct impact to uh, the revenue stream for the organization, as well as uh, quite often these days, they may result into fines from the, the regulators. So if you are a financial services company and uh, you fail to allow uh, your um, uh, clients to um, uh, conduct uh, financial transactions for whatever uh, security reason, uh, it is uh, very likely for the regulator to step in and uh, ask for the organization to pay uh, hefty fines. And uh, apart from that, uh, the impact to the reputation of uh, the organization is going to be significant. Uh, so in essence, the commercial side of uh, resilience helps strengthen the trust relationship between the organization and the clients. And um, at the same time, we know that uh, investors take very seriously the ability to the organization to have a sound security posture and be able to demonstrate operational resilience. And um, uh, so the commercial side of uh, the cyber uh, resilience uh, has very clear and tangible uh, benefits. No, definitely, I can, I can see that. And you know, as you mentioned, not only revenue streams, but also you know, share value, etc., and you know, future investors. So it's, um, I can see the um, definitely how it's a, you know, distinct advantage to utilize this approach. Um, so if an organization is is going about looking at um, resilience and elasticity. How do they start and how do they measure their success? How do they measure where they are? You know, you've got to start a point in the map. You've got to decide where you are. So how do they decide where they are? And then how do they measure um, the success and or how resilient they are as an organization? The starting point is uh, the most difficult, in my opinion, because the starting point um, involves the business. And uh, it is the business that will uh, identify what is uh, truly important for uh, the organization. So the important business services um, uh, should be identified by the business stakeholders. And we need to work with them in order to understand the value chain and the steps uh, that uh, those services uh, require and how technology comes to support them uh, by understanding the role of technology in those uh, important business services we then have a strong foundation upon which we can uh, put the hat of uh, the security uh, uh, expert on and uh, evaluate how cyber may have uh, an impact and uh, a detrimental impact to those services so um, Having done uh, that important step, then uh, we should uh, look at the security uh, posture and make sure that we do have certain characteristics in place. Uh, the easiest is uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we do have the security evergreening in place, which means that our security services won't be below a certain level by not accumulating sec security debt over the years and over the course of time. Uh, however, uh, one of the most important uh, characteristics of the security posture when it comes to resilience is our ability to predict things uh, instead of uh, playing the old catch up uh, game. Uh, in order to be able to predict uh, things from happening, uh, we need uh, to be uh, constantly scanning the threat landscape in order to uh, be aware of uh, all the techniques um, um, adversaries uh, deploy uh, or de even develop uh, that could potentially compromise our defenses and uh, then uh, be in a position to look at our own 
state to understand that we are not uh, vulnerable to those uh, uh, techniques. Um, so in order for an organization to be resilient, we, uh, we need a clear understanding of the asset, a very in-depth understanding of how security comes into play to support those assets. So the business alignment between security and uh, uh, the business side uh, is very important. Uh, but uh, we also need uh, certain characteristics when it comes to uh, the security portion. As I said, we need to be able to lean forward and predict certain things uh, that will give us the ability to uh, undertake uh, improvements to our security posture before those are needed. And uh, we should uh, be continuously monitoring our systems in order to develop an understanding of what normal looks like. This is uh, the last line of defense uh, when it comes to resilience. Why? Because if we are dealing with a successful attack, this means that all the preventative mechanisms have failed. Uh, quite often, if we are facing an advanced attack, detection mechanisms um, also uh, struggle. And uh, therefore, we should rely on uh, our understanding of what a normal operations look like so that uh, when we see the smallest deviation from that normality we will know that um, it warrants further investigation and i'm saying this because quite often uh, we, we, we see that uh, most of the security uh, attacks that are successful go undetected for a long time that gives an opportunity to an attacker to move laterally within our systems, um, uh, develop a very good understanding of uh, what is important and go after the uh, critical assets. So um, not a straightforward answer, I'm afraid, I feel, <coughs> but uh, a quite uh, pragmatic one. In terms of, let's say, um, organizations and um, let's say the CISOs and heads of security and also you know business stakeholders watching this, um, in your opinion, what's the biggest threat that businesses face in the next sort of six, 12 or 24 months? <laughs> the biggest threat. Uh, or the most important action they can take. Um, if you were, I know obviously your organization, Kiomos, advises a lot of businesses and helps them to improve their security posture. So if you're advising just a, a general piece of advice for people watching this, what's the thing that they should? look at today, whether they should assess or protect or look at what, what's, a, what, what's a couple of actions that they can take, the takeaways from this, uh, from this session? Yeah, very difficult to answer the question, but um, I will be frank with you. Uh, more often than not, we see organizations chasing the latest trend. Um, I would uh, be talking about AI security, about uh, uh, very cutting edge, bleeding edge uh, technologies. Um, however, most of the organizations, uh, even these days, are struggling to truly uh, understand their assets and uh, what they truly possess. And uh, so uh, instead of just following the hype, in the market, um, a very important step is to go back to the basics. Make sure that we know all our uh, assets, that we have a clear understanding of the state, and uh, which will allow us to uh, become fully aware of uh, the attack surface. And we should look at our security uh, posture. Security posture from uh, an architectural perspective that will allow us to develop a single uh, source of truth. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that um, most of the organizations um, struggle to provide timely responses when it comes to uh, security related questions, because uh, the information they need in order to form a position and provide a response 
uh, is uh, documented in static documents scattered across the organization, uh, which makes it uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to identify all the documents that you need uh, to provide the response. And quite often, uh, the information is not even documented, but it is in people's heads. And some of these people may not be uh, any more part of the organization. That is uh, why we believe and we advise our customers to build a proper knowledge repository uh, in some organizations, depending on the maturity, they would call it uh, an enterprise architecture framework. In uh, some others, they will call it a very detailed uh, security service catalog. Uh, the simplest term that I use is uh, a landing place for all this security related knowledge to come together somewhere centrally. So a data model for someone coming from a technology background with all the security information uh, so that we can query the data model and create uh, the viewpoints that are needed uh, as part of the response uh, to the business requirement we receive. And um, of course, uh, that uh, requires uh, some uh, uh, advanced uh, visualizations in order to be able to communicate succinctly and in a single, uh, single, um, sorry, single language uh, what the answer is by, of course, having the actuarial data to support it. Brilliant. Um, but Dimi, look, it's been an absolute pleasure spending time with you again. I really appreciate you giving us some time. Um, obviously, people can check back episode one um, if they haven't done so already. And if they want to seek you out, oh, I know you can find you on LinkedIn and then your website, uh, kiomos.com, is it? Um, yes. Q-I-O-M-O-S.com. Uh, they can seek you out and find you there and uh, get your advice. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And I hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. -bye. Just bye.